devices of Satan. Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom withstand steadfast in your faith, knowing the same sufferings are accomplished in your brethren who are in the world. These two scriptural passages indicate to us how full of evil devices Satan his basic work is to camouflage whatever he does so that people will not know it is his doing. He even fashions himself into an angel of light. All his works are done under the cover of deceit. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and he always lies. Of all that he has ever done, he has never willingly and openly acknowledged anything as his work. If he were to make a public report of his works, probably nobody would want them, everyone would probably resist them. For this reason, he always disguises his work in a multitude of ways. The work of Satan. Satan's works are manifold. In order for a Christian to walk well before God, he must learn how to resist Satan. In order to do that, he must discern what is the work of Satan. According to the judgment of the Bible, many so-called natural things are actually satanic works. From a human point of view we may consider something to be incidental, natural, or circumstantial, but the Bible distinctly labels it as the work of the devil. If we are to follow a straight course, God's children must not be ignorant of the devices of Satan, how full of wiles he is, how pretentious and deceptive. We should recognize him, in order to resist him. The work of Satan in the human mind. Let us now mention a few of Satan's devices so that we may resist him and overcome him before the Lord. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but mighty before God to the casting down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that is exalted against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Satan surrounds man with strongholds so as to prevent him from obeying Christ. The special field of his work is found in man's mind or thought life. Oftentimes man is bombarded with speculations or imaginations which are adverse to the obedience of Christ. Paul says the weapons of our warfare against these are not of the flesh. These imaginations must first be destroyed before we can bring our thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The sphere of Satan's operation is in man's thought life. He will inject a thought, an imagination, which appears to be your own. Under this deception, you accept it and use it as if it were yours, though in actuality it is his. Do remember that many things in the life of a Christian begin with speculations or imaginations. Many sins are first committed in the imagination of the mind. Many unpleasantnesses among brothers and sisters arise from these fancies. Then there are those sudden thoughts. Sometimes a thought will flash into one's mind that a certain brother is wrong. Many of God's children do not recognize such thoughts as the work of Satan. A person may consider such a thought as his own and take it as true, thinking that the brother really is wrong. And yet, this is not true. It is Satan who has put the thought into his mind. How is he to resist the devil? He must say, I do not want this thought. I return it to you, Satan. Should he accept it, it will become his own thought. It is Satan's at the start, but it will become his if he keeps it. Christians need to know what satanic temptation is. Satanic temptation enters mainly, if not exclusively, in the form of thought. When Satan tempts people, he does not attach a label saying, This is satanic temptation. If people knew it was of Satan, they would resist it. No, he sneaks in stealthily without causing a ripple. All his temptations are formulated so as not to easily arouse the Christians. He does not want them to suspect him, he would rather have them sleep on. So he surreptitiously injects a thought into their mind. Once they accept it, it has become a foothold for him. This is why the children of God must learn how to resist inordinate thoughts. However, they also should be careful lest they become overly attentive. 
Any excess in this respect will cause further confusion of the thoughts, causing them to fall further into the wiles of the enemy. If one is concentrating on his thoughts, his eyes will not be focusing on the Lord. We must, indeed, resist improper thoughts, yet we should not be wholly occupied with our thoughts. I would like to cry aloud that over these years I have seen two extremes. Some people exercise no restraint in their thoughts, others are totally taken up with dealing with their thoughts. The latter are just as deceived by Satan as the former. Further, they are likely candidates for a nervous breakdown. So we need to maintain the right balance. We should not allow Satan to tempt us by injecting his thoughts, neither should we be engrossed in how to deal with our thoughts. If we are constantly taken up with dealing with our thoughts, then we have fallen into Satan's temptation, for, instead of having our eyes on the Lord, they are on our thoughts. Satanic thoughts can be quite easily withstood. There is a saying frequently quoted by many servants of the Lord that goes, You cannot forbid a bird to fly over your head, but you certainly can forbid it to make a nest in your hair. Do remember, then, that though you cannot prohibit many thoughts from passing through your mind, you can prohibit them from nesting in you. As a thought flashes through you, you may thrust it away by simply saying, I do not want it. I will not accept it. I reject it. Then you will see that it is thrown out. Many of God's children have great difficulty with their thoughts. They cannot easily control them. Of the many letters I have received over these past years, the one question most frequently asked is, how can I control my thoughts? Some confess that they find it especially difficult to control their thoughts during their prayer time. At this point there is something I would like to say briefly. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honorable, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. The Bible tells us. Think on these things. God's children should learn to engage their thoughts in positive thinking. The more they use their mind positively, the less their thoughts will be out of control. Many are not able to control their thoughts because they do not think. They are passive in their thought life. This gives Satan the opportunity to insert some of his many ready-made thoughts into their mind. Satan will not find it so easy to inject his thought into your mind if you learn to use your mind for thinking on things spiritual, good, righteous, holy, peaceful, and lovable. When your mind is positively engaged and your thoughts are not idle, Satan has no opportunity. But if a Christian's mind is unoccupied and idle, then that passive, ungirded mind of his is open to satanic infiltration. Because of this, God's children ought to exercise their minds as they exercise their bodies. This will prevent the intrusion of satanic thoughts. Learn to recognize what thoughts are unclean, divisive, and slanderous, and then learn to resist them as soon as they are discovered to be of the enemy. Many thoughts are distinctly satanic and therefore can be easily rejected. Some thoughts, though, are quite subtle and therefore not so easily repudiated. Nonetheless, we must learn to resist all of them. Satan is neither omniscient nor omnipresent. He is, however, acquainted with many things, for through his evil spirits, the sinful angels, he has spread an intelligence network throughout the earth. When we are idle, Satan easily puts something that is known to him, but not to us, into our thought. He injects the intelligence that his secret service has obtained into our thoughts. He makes us fancy something, imagine something, and thus thrusts his intelligence into our mind. As soon as we ponder it and accept it, it becomes real to us. God's children, therefore, must reject all communications from Satan, even if such communications do shed light on things. We should refuse to know anything that does not come to our knowledge by revelation received through prayer. A child of God must not be curious or nosy. If he is not, he will escape many satanic thoughts. If he is, Satan will supply him endlessly with some of the many things he knows. 
The Christian at first may think that such knowledge is beneficial. However, if he continues to accept these thoughts, he will soon become a pawn in Satan's hand. Satan will employ the Christian's mind to do his work. It is for this reason that one must resist all causeless thoughts. Whenever a thought about another brother's fault flashes into one's mind, if it comes from the thought of the mind and not from the consciousness of the spirit, it should be rejected. If it is accepted, it will eventually become a personal conviction. One who thinks a brother has done him wrong will soon reckon it to be real. Consequently, he will break fellowship with his brother. Unless these sudden thoughts are cut off at the beginning, they will get out of hand afterward. When satanic temptations first invade the mind, they are relatively easy to deal with, but once they become facts in the mind, they are most difficult to get rid of. For this reason we must deal with thoughts. We must reject all unclean thoughts lest we sin. We must actively use our mind so as not to live a loose and dissipated life. Under God's light, we shall see that many sins come through receiving temptations in the thought life. Let me reiterate, after a thought is first resisted, the matter is considered closed. When the thought comes the second time, it should be ignored. In other words, when a thought first comes to you, resist it by faith, believing that it has fled away. Should it present itself the second time, it comes as a lie, not the truth. Therefore, you must reckon it as false and declare that you have already resisted it. Take this position until the thought flees. If you acknowledge the returned thought as true, you shall soon find it so attached to you that you can hardly throw it off. Many defeats may be attributed to this error. If you resist the devil, he will flee from you. This is the word of the Lord and it is totally trustworthy. Whatever Satan says is undependable. The Lord says, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Therefore, that which comes back again must be a fake and should be totally discredited. Why are the minds of so many Christians confused? It is because they are always resisting. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you, says the Bible. Resist him once, and he will flee. You ought to believe that he has fled away. You do not need to resist him many times. Simply believe that he has fled, for this is in accordance with God's word. Whatever then comes back is not true. You can well afford to ignore it, and, if you do, it will soon disappear. It lurks just outside the door, trying to peep in. If you reckon it is true, it will immediately step in. So, the basic principle is, resist the first time, ignore the second time. If a second time indeed comes, you do not even need to resist, all that is necessary is to not pay the slightest attention. To resist the second time is to discredit the first resistance, to resist the third time is to refute the first and the second resistance, and so on. Each new resistance means one more distrust of your former resistance. Because you do not believe what the Lord has said, resist the devil, and he will flee from you, you resist to the hundredth time. You will be occupied with resisting from dawn to dusk. The more you think, the more confused you become. The more you use your mind, the more severely you suffer. Therefore, do not resist foolishly. Simply believe that once resisted the devil will flee.